Okay, let's begin chapter 8 of Wade. Uh, here this will be a very heavy chapter as we're going to be looking at the reactions of alkenes. How do these things react? So a review of the bonding of alkenes. Remember we have a pi bond. One of the key things about pi electrons is that they are very loosely held and so they can act as a free lone pair or as a base. Or in this case too they can also act as a nucleophile and that pi electrons attack electrophilic species. Very important here. And we're going to see carbocation intermediates in these reactions. So as a result these are what are going to be called electrophilic addition reactions to double bonds where an electrophile will be attacked by the pi bond acting as a nucleophile. Okay, So this here, this statement's not purely correct. It's not the double bond acting as a nucleophile. No, it's the pi bond or the pi electrons that act as the nucleophile. Here you see a picture of it. Remember half of the pi bond is on top, the other half's on the bottom. And the way we're going to show this mechanism is again the pi electrons attacking some electrophilic species. So one carbon of the double bond will get the electrophile and the other will be left with an empty p orbital which is the sign of a carbocation. So let's look at this step by step. Okay, So here we have the pi electrons attacking the electrophile. I choose one of the carbons to add the electrophile on and the other carbon gets the positive charge. Then in the second step my nucleophile whatever it is can come and attack the positive carbocation here to then add on. And these are some different types of electrophilic addition reactions. Okay, you can look at these here. You see we're going to be adding different things across the double bond to get different kinds of products. Okay, so these are the different reactions we're going to explore in this chapter. The first one that's easiest to understand is adding HX to alkenes, where again X is going to stand for some halogen like chlorine, so HCl or HBr and so forth. The first step is the protonation of the double bond or the pi bond. And this protonation step is going to occur so that the carbocation that forms is the most stable as possible. And in the second step, the nucleophile attacks the carbocation where we get a product being an alkyl halide. And so we can do this reaction with HBr, HCl, and HI. Here's an example of one with HBr. So we have the pi electrons attacking the hydrogen, which remember is delta plus. So we choose one of the two carbons to add it on. And then in the second step, the bromine attacks the positive charge. Here we want to introduce a very important rule, Markovnikov's rule. Okay, So here it's stated, let's read it, the addition of a proton or hydrogen to the pi bond of an alkene results in a product with the acidic proton bonded to the carbon atom that already holds the greater number of hydrogens. Okay, I don't like this definition. It's a bunch of garbage. Okay, The better definition is this one here. You can write it down or watch the video. Is that when the pi bond attacks the hydrogen, say in HBr, the 
resulting carbocation that forms is the one that is the most substituted or most stable carbocation. Okay, so that's a better way to state Markovnikov's rule. Okay, so they try to do it again in an electrophilic addition reaction to an alkene. The electrophile adds in such a way that it generates the most stable intermediate. Okay, this one here is a lot better than this garbage up here. Okay. So let's take a look at Markovnikov's rule in force. Okay, so here we have the pi electrons attacking the hydrogen. Again, as you saw in the video, I like to draw a lone pair on this double bond. That's attacking the hydrogen. Bromine leaves. And the hydrogen has added here to this carbon so that the positive charge forms on this carbon. So we get a tertiary carbocation. If we would have done it the other way, where the hydrogen adds on this carbon, like that, then we would have got a secondary carbocation. Okay? So if you compare carbocation intermediates, this tertiary is more stable, so the reaction will want to proceed in this way. Okay? So this is Markovnikov's rule, where we're producing the most stable carbocation as possible. Here's another example where the pi electrons attacking this hydrogen, so the more stable carbocation is forming. Here it's again tertiary, or down here it's secondary. So this will be more stable, so the bromine will add on that carbon there. Okay, now we'll switch gears and look at the free radical addition of HBr. In the presence of peroxides, HBr adds to an alkene to form the anti-Markovnikov product, or sometimes called the non-Markovnikov product. Okay, where here the bromine ends up not on the most substituted carbon, but on the least substituted carbon. Okay, it's because in this reaction, this is a free radical reaction. Okay. So let's take a look at an example. Here's a peroxide. If I heat it up, this peroxide bond homolytically cleaves to two radicals. And then they didn't show it here, but then this one of these radicals reacts with HBr and the oxygen takes a hydrogen and leaves us with Br dot. Okay, I showed this in the lecture video as well. Okay, then the Br dot reacts with the pi bond. So the pi electrons attack and the bromine adds to the least substituted so that the more substituted carbon gets the radical. Okay, Because a more substituted radical is more stable. And then lastly this radical can combine and take a hydrogen from HBr to give you the final product. Okay, so here it's showing you the reasoning for this anti Markovnikov. It's because a more stable radical ends up forming by having the bromine adding to the less substituted carbon of the double bond. Okay, and again, a review of radical stability. Okay, so here's another example. Okay, so if I see that peroxide, 
that's going to tell me that the bromine will add on to the less substituted carbon of the double bond. Okay, our next reaction is hydration of alkenes, where we react with water and an acid catalyst. And when we do that, we get the Markovnikov alcohol, meaning what? The OH adds on the more substituted carbon of the double bond. Okay, here's the mechanism. Okay, when you have water and H plus, the H plus can add to water to give you the hydronium ion. In any event, it's the same reaction where the pi electrons attack H plus, giving you the more substituted carbocation. The water then adds on to the carbocation, making each of these hydrogens acidic so that another water can take an acidic hydrogen and thus form the alcohol. Okay. Again, watch the lecture video as this is covered in detail there as well. Okay, again, it's following Markovnikov's rule. Rearrangements are possible with alkene chemistry. Okay, in this example, after the pi electrons attack a hydrogen, give this secondary carbocation, you can end up getting a methyl shift to get a more stable tertiary carbocation to which then the alcohol could add on. Okay, our next reaction is the oxymercuration demercuration reaction, a two-step reaction to form an alcohol where we first react the double bond with mercuric acetate and water and then react with sodium borohydride to give us the Markovnikov alcohol. Okay, so here we have two ways to form a Markovnikov alcohol. In that reaction there is no possibility of rearrangements. Okay, here's just some extra details that aren't uh, important. Here they show the mechanism of this reaction where the pi bonds attack the mercury to give this three-membered mercurinium ion. The water then attacks the more substituted carbon and then you get deprotonation and then this thing gets reduced with sodium borohydride to give you the alcohol. So here is that second step, the demercuration reaction where the sodium borohydride takes off the mercuric part. Here we see Markovnikov's rule enforced in that reaction, okay, where after the mercurinium ion has formed, okay, this bond wants to break here so as to give a more stable delta plus here. So the water attacks the more substituted carbon because that's where this bond is wanting to break. And then that's what yields the uh, Markovnikov alcohol. Okay, and note down here that again the reaction does not suffer rearrangements because there is no full carbocation intermediate. Okay, and here we can do the reaction instead with water, we could do it with an alcohol. And when the alcohol adds on, we end up with an ether as the final product.
product. Okay, so beware what you're adding here in the mercuric acetate first step. It can either be water to give an alcohol or add an alcohol to end up with an ether. Okay, just another example where you end up with the Markovnikov ether forming down here. Next reaction is the hydroboration of alkenes. Okay, this is another way to make an alcohol, but one big difference, we get the anti or the non-Markovnikov product. Okay, so here the OH will go on what? The less substituted carbon of the double bond. Okay, so our reagents here are BH3, borane, and in the second step, hydrogen peroxide and OH minus. Okay, you could also use diborane instead, uh, but no big deal here. Here they show the mechanism of the hydroboration. stoichiometry, which we won't fool around with here. Then in the second step, we oxidize the boron part using this reagent complex to the alcohol. The stereochemistry of hydroboration is that it gives the syn product, that is the OH, and the hydrogen that I've added on are on the same side. Okay, we'll skip over this. Okay, so here's another example. Again, when I use borane, the OH goes on the less substituted carbon of the double bond. Next reaction is the addition of halogens. Okay, so I can add X2, which is usually chlorine or bromine, and the two halogens add on anti across the double bond. And so here we'll end up with trans products. Okay, anti addition. Here's the mechanism, kind of similar to the mercuric acetate. Pi electrons attack. We form this three-membered halonium ring. Then the second halogen comes in and comes in opposite from the top one to give you the trans product here of anti-addition. Here's an example with bromine. So the pi electrons attack. We form the bromonium ion. Then the second bromine attacks in the, on the opposite side. So we end up with the trans product. Okay, so here we're seeing that anti-addition occurring. Okay, here we see it again. A little more complicated setup. Adding bromine getting the trans here, starting with transbutene instead of cis, ends up the bromines at a, opposite each other again. Sometimes bromine is used as a test to see if there's a double bond in the molecule. Okay, bromine is red, and so if I add the red, and it stays red, that means there were no double bonds because there was no reaction. Okay. If it disappears, then that means there was a double bond because it did react. Okay, so this is a qualitative test to see if there's any double bonds in the molecule.
the formation of halohydrins is here, halohydrins. We have a chlorine or a bromine or an iodine vicinal to each other. Okay. How to form halohydrins is when we use X2 and water in the reaction simultaneously. And this gives Markovnikov addition where the bromine ends up on the less substituted carbon and the OH ends up on the more substituted carbon. Okay, so here is an example. Okay, so water is adding on anti here to give this halohydrin. Okay, here if we start with cyclopentene, we see the trans geometry as a result. Okay, here if the water is attacking this uh, chlorinium ion, note it's attacking the more substituted carbon. Okay, so the OH ends up on the more substituted carbon. Okay, we see this example again where the alcohol is ending up Markovnikov. Our next reaction is hydrogenation of double bonds. And what we typically use is hydrogen gas and one of these three catalysts, platinum, palladium, or nickel. And what happens is that the two hydrogen atoms add across to transform the double bond to a single bond or it saturates the double bond. Okay, so here's an example of 2-butene. Hydrogenating it converts it to butane. Okay, and it's important that I have a catalyst. No catalyst, no reaction. The other important part of the reaction is that it occurs with syn stereochemistry. We'll just move on from this. to worry about the carbenes here. Okay, so a lot of this stuff we can just skip, including this. Epoxidation reactions is when I take an alkene and react with a peroxy acid, which is C double bond O, 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 then H. What happens then is I get a three-membered ring with an oxygen forming across where the double bond was. And these are called epoxides or oxiranes. One of the most common peroxy acid is this thing here called MCPBA, which stands for meta-chloroperoxybenzoic acid. Okay, here's the mechanism of how the epoxide forms. Okay, I won't hold you accountable for this. Here's MCPBA. You can see its structure. Okay. Note if you start off with a cis tube butene, you end up with the cis epoxide. If you start with the trans, you get the trans epoxide. Okay, then they proceed with some ring opening reactions of epoxides. We're going to hold off of this stuff until we get to uh, chapters later on in chapter 14. Okay, so chapter 14 will cover this stuff. Okay, so you don't have to worry about this for now. The next reaction of alkenes is what's called the hydroxylation reaction where we react with osmonium tetroxide 
and H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, or another way you could do it is react with KMnO4, which is potassium permanganate, and OH-. Both reactions give you the syn addition of two OHs to give you the cis diol. Okay, so again, two ways to do that. Okay, here's the mechanism of the reaction. Okay, no need to go into that for right now. Here's the mechanism with the potassium permanganate. Okay, note it's giving you the cis diol here on the ring. Note the other property is that it gives a magnesium oxide precipitate. So this is another way to determine if my molecule had a double bond, I would start seeing this MnO2 precipitate. Okay, you can see it comes out as a brown, dark brown precipitate. Another reaction is what's called the oxidative cleavage with potassium permanganate. This time we use a warm or acidic solution of KMnO4. Disubstituted carbons become ketones. Monosubstituted carbons become carboxylic acids. Let's look at an example. So here uh, we have this alkene note, KMnO4, warm concentrated. So one part of it, this part here, becomes the ketone and this other side here becomes a carboxylic acid. And here are a couple of examples uh, to show that. Okay, so this carbon here had a hydrogen and so that part there becomes the carboxylic acid. There's no hydrogen here so this part becomes the ketone. Another reaction is ozonolysis, where what we do is we use ozone, which is O3, and dimethyl sulfide. What we do in this reaction is we cleave the double bond, and we put a double bond O on each side where the double bond was. Okay, so a very easy way to remember the ozonolysis reaction. Here's the mechanism of it, which uh, we won't go into. Okay, here's kind of a problem working backwards. If you did an ozonolysis reaction and we found these two products, what was the original alkene? All you do is you simply join the two carbons that have the double bond O with a double bond. Okay, So these would be the two possible starting alkenes that would have been there. Okay, Lastly, alkenes can undergo polymerizations to form polymers. There's three ways to make polymers. Cationic free radical, and anionic polymerizations. Okay, cationic involves carbocations, where we take a, uh, an alkene and react it with some kind of acid to help start generating the polymerization, where you see more and more of these isobutylenes adding on to each other until eventually you get a long chain of them. Okay, just move on from this. Okay, another way to do cationic polymerizations using BF3. We'll go into that. Radical polymerizations. Okay, if you took styrene and a 
radical. You could start a free radical polymerization of styrene to eventually make polystyrene. And anionic polymerizations, you start with a base and off goes the polymerization that way. Here's a way to make superglue. And that's it.